Right, hello and welcome to another expert insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Bill Treasurer. How are you doing, Bill? All right, John. Looking forward to being with you. Excellent. And I'm here in San Diego. And Bill, you are, where are you today? Asheville, North Carolina in the mountains. Excellent, excellent. I'm in, a, I'm in, this is unusual, I'm in a rainy San Diego. It's our sixth day of rain. I think pretty much unheard of. People are starting to question whether they should continue living here. Uh, Everybody's lost it, their minds. <laughs> yeah. One of the great American cities. I yeah, love it out there yeah. in San Diego. So Bill is the founder and chief encouragement officer at Giant Leap Consulting. Uh, Bill has written a number of books, including his latest one, what's a leadership kick in the ass? Yeah, actually, I have a newer one, too. It's called The the Leadership Killer. The Leadership uh, Killer, yeah. That's about the dangers of arrogance to leadership and the importance of humility. Mm. uh, And Bill, uh, you were a former member of the U.S. high diving. I was reading this and I was going, oh, my goodness, like diving from heights over 100 feet, sometimes on fire. Was that deliberate? (laughs) (laughs) It was. And actually, it's the genesis of how I became enamored Mm -hmm. with the idea of courage Mm -hmm. and the the whole research that I put into the idea of courage is my founding point. If you rewind, you know, I've got legitimate business credentials, too. But if you rewind the story enough, you get back to where I was a, a diver. I was a springboard diver and I was, I was getting good at it. It became my little sport when I was about 15 years old and I got good at it, but eventually they're going to ask divers to go up and do a high dive off the Mm -hmm. three meter. And I was petrified of heights. And then they started to dangle scholarships in front of me Uh for college. And so my coach had to sit down with me and it's like, Bill, you've got a real opportunity here, but you're going to have to deal with this fear of heights. And through this process, incrementally and slowly, he was able to lift the board. We actually had a diving board that was on a hydraulic lift. So he could move from one meter to one and a half meters. And I was scared. And then I'd get used to it. Then he could go to two meters. And through this process, it's actually called the mere exposure effect. Mm. The more you merely get exposed to the thing you're petrified of, the less power it has over you, you become desensitized to it. And so the kid who started out with a profound fear of heights eventually did a dive from the high board, eventually got a full scholarship to college, and then traveled around the world as a member of the U.S. high diving team, diving from heights that scale to 100 feet, traveling at speeds in 50 miles an hour into a small pool that was 10 feet deep, protected only by a Speedo. <laughs> I love it. That's such a great... I thought you were going to say when they dangled a scholarship that your parents were behind you pushing you off the board. (laughs) (laughs) That would have been part of it too. That would have been part of it too. So what we wanted to talk about today is the whole idea of courage and courage being the first virtue of business and leadership. So when you talk about... Okay, when you talk about courage, tell me what you mean mean by it, particularly in in a business sense. Sure. And it's a good question. So... Actually, Aristotle called it the first virtue mm-hmm. of life. That, uh, and the reason it, for that is, he said, because it's the virtue that makes all the other virtues possible. Right. Uh, it's the virtue that informs and strengthens all the other virtues. And by the way, C.S. Lewis said the same thing, and Eleanor Roosevelt. And outside of work, it's always been the most important, if not the single premier virtue that makes the other one so strong. And my whole proposition is, why would it be any different inside of work, mm-hmm. especially since many workplaces are bastions of fear? And whenever fear is present, it's is the opportunity to instigate courage. So I look at courage as uh, when you are facing a fearful situation that you are perfectly capable of doing, but fear is becoming blockage for you, that becomes an opportunity to exercise your courage. And it allows you to do things that are hard, scary, and challenging, but the sacrifice that you have to pay is the encountering of fear. But if you think about it, you know, to be a great salesperson, mm-hmm means to knock on hundreds of doors in the face of rejection over and over again and carry forward. To be a great innovator, almost always the greatest innovations, because they're so disruptive, eventually come down to being a blasphemer. Mm -hmm. you got to be willing to be blasphemous if you want to be an inventor and to be innovative. So that takes courage. And leadership means to render bold decisions that many people are going to disagree with and to withstand that resistance And that takes courage. Courage Mm -hmm. is never comfortable. It's almost always uncomfortable. But if we anchor to doing it to the right thing, and frankly, often the moralistic thing, uh, we will inform ourselves and we'll gain strength to do the things that are fearful. 
So in 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 a business context, right, it's it's always very easy just to stick with the status quo, right? And it's very easy to when somebody suggests something go, mm, no, I don't think that'll work. It's much harder to be courageous because uh, by being courageous, courageous is a lonely place, right? Yeah, courageous is a lonely place. And uh, very often, uh, you know, to do it's hard. It's put it this way. It's harder to do the courageous thing than to do the not courageous thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's always, whenever, we, a lot of times courage is the application of risk. It's risk in action. And most risks come down to the risk of action. Hey, if I do this thing, I could wipe out, I could get really hurt, I'll do this high dive and I'll get welts on my mm -hmm. leg and it's really scary. But then there's the slower, the risk and danger of inaction. Mm -hmm. When we stay with the status quo because it's convenient and it's really comfortable, but over time our skills are diminishing, uh, we're becoming complacent, we're becoming apathetic, and suddenly our competitors start to bypass us. Right. So yeah, it's easy to do, but it's really dangerous to stay with the status quo. There's this idea of, you know, if you want to be courageous, you do. You need a certain degree of psychological safety. But if you play it safe all the time, if all of your actions are about safety motivated or self-preservation, ultimately you could become so self, so safe, mm -hmm. you've now become dangerous. And here's the thing, right? So, uh, so what prevents a lot of pe people from doing um, or being courageous? And that's obviously the fear of failing, right? And the fear of what might happen. So um, how do you get to the point where you're able to say, okay, I might fail, it mightn't work, but I feel it's the right thing to do right now? Mm. So I do think that the fear of failure is huge, right? Mm -hmm. People are afraid of looking foolish when they wipe out in front mm -hmm. of other people and, and yeah. self-consciousness and such. There's also, too, the fear of success, that if I True. do this thing and it works out really well, I'm going to be obliged to do it continually <laughs> and maybe in increasing levels. So that comes with its own uh, thing of fear. I think what happens is eventually you have to kind of get to the uh, – let's just say the flip it stage where you're like, ah, oh, flip it. I got, you know, what I'm going to do, not do it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of people will tell me in my courage building workshops that they'll get to a place where they're like, look, I just thought of, and they'll tell me about something courageous that they did, the founding of a business or to be the second person to join a business and follow somebody else's vision has been hard for people. But a lot of people will tell me, you know, I just looked at the situation. I said, I'm not going to die. I'm not nice. going to die from doing this thing. And so they were able to you know, use that as perspective. In my case, I, I could tell you a quick story. Uh, in addition to having been a high diver, after I retired my Speedo, I was a, <laughs> uh, I was a whitewater kayaker. And I would go uh, down you know, treacherous class mm -hmm. four and five rivers in my boat. And there was this one river, the Koei River, where they had the Olympics a few years back, uh, where there's a, a rapid called Grumpy. And right. Grumpy is a big, boulderous rapid, right? Yeah, that doesn't, a, a rapid named Grumpy just doesn't sound like a good place to be. <laughs> but it's not as bad as Decapitation Rock, which is another. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going down Grumpy, and, and there, there's a tough, it's actually like a class two ferry move, but with class four and five consequences. You mm. got to get it right. You got to get that somewhat simple move right, because if you don't, you're going to go upside down in your boat like I did. And I peeled out of my boat. Now it's totally unsafe. I'm getting bounced around by boulders. I got uh, a big bruise on my backside. And for two years, I would take what we call the walk of shame, where all my buddies were doing the class two move and going down grumpy. And I'd have to carry my boat and walk around grumpy with my friends laughing at me. And then finally, after two years, I sat down with a friend of mine. It's like, Bill, you know, you keep looking at the big panoramic risk and how gigantic it was. And you keep remembering this bad thing that happened to you. If you just break it down, just focus on the ferry move. All you got to do is a class two ferry move, which you've done a thousand times. But because you got bit that one time, you're focusing on all the other stuff. So a lot of times when you just break down the real risk – and the legitimate risk. You bring it down to size, you get it, and and you just manage that piece of it, then everything else will take care of itself. So instead of thinking about the big high dive you got to do, mm -hmm. think about your lead ups to that high dive. And just today, just today, concentrate on the 10 foot jump you've got to do, and then worry about the 15 foot jump tomorrow, and so on until you do your big high dive. Yeah, I, I really like uh, I really like that whole concept because it, it's true. If you think about it, we always think 
when we go to do something where our thoughts suddenly go huge and we're like, all of these terrible things could happen. Or like you said, the other one is it could be really successful and then maybe, oh, maybe I'll have to relocate and maybe they promote me and I'd have more responsibility. And like, that sounds good. But oh, my goodness, do I really want that? Um, yeah. So when you do so you do courage, leadership, to training workshops and, and program training programs. So how do you how do you break it down for people? What are your steps in, to get people to be able to be comfortable with being courageous? Yeah, so I've got a courage building training program that I've literally taught around the world in 11 countries, thousands of executives. You can go to couragebuilding.com and mm -hmm. you can find it. Um, and what we do is we break it down into three types of courage. So instead of thinking of courage as this big, ambiguous, amorphous mass, carve it down to size and we break it down to three. There's, there may be more than three buckets, but I look at it as three buckets of courage. The first one is the courage to try things you haven't done before. The courage of initiative or action, I call it try courage. You can often mm -hmm. think of it as the courage of first attempts. Right. The first time you do something, you're having to try it that mm -hmm. first time. The second bucket of courage is not the courage of action. In fact, sometimes it's the courage of inaction. It's the courage of vulnerability and exposure that we call trust courage. The courage nice. to trust others, to trust the direction of others, to uh, get into an, a relationship with others, knowing that you could get betrayed, which mm -hmm. is you know, really sometimes catastrophic. And that's the risk you have to assume. The third bucket of courage is what we call tell courage. The courage of voice or assertiveness, the courage of the truth teller. So we look at courage in action, which is try courage, vulnerability, trust courage, and tell courage, which is assertiveness. And so once we break that down, then we can, in our courage building training programs, we work each one of those uh, mm -hmm. uh, types of courage somewhat separately. So the first, so the first part is you have to learn to, uh, as you said, you know, try try something new. So I guess the first step is get people over that fear of even breaking out of the norm, even attempting something, and being comfortable if it doesn't work. Yeah, you know, we we by introducing them to the three buckets of courage: try, trust, and tell. By highlighting this first virtue and and where what we mean by courage, then we can start asking them: okay, what is important to you? So to each individual, including yourself, mm -hmm. you know, what is the high dive? that could transform your career? What, what is the platform of safety that you might be stuck on that you need to get off of? In other words, what is your goal? What's a worth applying courage to in the first place? Because courage is important mojo. You shouldn't be using it all the time in every instance. So what are the important things? Basically, your goal, your vision, your mission, what you're trying to do with your career and life, your purpose. What's the big important thing that's worth of putting your courage in that direction mm -hmm. for in the first place, which makes it tangible to you? Because every human being, is called to take high dives personally and professionally right. at some point in their career. Yeah, and I think that's a great point is because uh, I don't think people spend enough time figuring out what is their high dive, right? And I think uh, obviously that's that's a, that's a starting point for for everybody. So how do you have people uncover that? Because I mean, most people, if you said to them, you know, what is, and you explain what you're talking about and said, what is your high dive? You'd probably stump most people initially anyway. Yeah. Well, a lot of questions, a lot of times we'll ask people a question that, that's kind of a secret question, mm -hmm. meaning that you know the answer to it, but most people might not know the answer to it. And we'll ask people to consider where are you playing it too safe? Mm -hmm. You know, where, where is that place in your life that there's a little too much safety if you get honest about it, that you're avoiding doing something that you know you ought to do? Uh, I think most people know that. And right. if you can get that, that starts to, to point you in the direction of the purposeful thing that might be worthwhile doing. Because then it becomes a matter of how do we figure out the fear attached to that thing? Why is it worth it to work it through that fear to get to that thing, whatever that thing may be? Mm -hmm. So where are you playing it too safe is a really good question. Yeah, that's great. And the second one, I like that you said about the vulnerability, the trust part, right? Um, you know, I always find that the longer you, the longer you're in the workplace, and and you manage teams and work with people, the more you discover most people have been burned a hundred times by different people, and a lot of times they're just like, I don't trust anybody anymore. So how do you help people get over that? Because we all have it, right? We've all been burned. Man, my brother is a now retired special agent in the Drug Enforcement Administration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So 
people lied to his face on a <laughs> daily basis, right? And that guy got a little jaded, right? Because mm-hmm. so, if you take that posture into your regular life where you've right. got a great deal of skepticism <laughs> towards people, it's going to become blockage to building strong relationships. Mm-hmm. So you've got to be able to manage it. Most of us, by the time we turn 40, have definitely been betrayed at some point. And if we get honest about it, most of us, by the time we're 40, have betrayed somebody right. too. Mm-hmm. And so it sort of comes with the idea of trust. I guess you know what we do in, is have the people consider – a, what's your own criteria for trust? Do you need to have other people tr- prove they can be trusted? Um, and how does it relate to relationships? I get people thinking about the person who trusts them the most in this world. Who's a person that they trust the most and who trusts them the most? And what are the characteristics of that person that make that person so special? Oftentimes, it's that person took an interest in me. I knew that person cared about me. A simple thing like I knew that person listened to me Mm -hmm. and valued what I had to say. And then you say, well, to what extent are you doing that for the people that are working for you too? Because trust is is that important element that holds relationships together. You know, I'm sure you probably have read the book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team uh, by Patrick Lencioni. Mm -hmm. The number one dysfunction of a team right at the base is lack of trust. If you don't have trust – Ultimately, it impacts results and impacts the health and strength and vibrancy of your relationships. So if you don't have it, you got to figure out a way to get to it if, you, if you're in a leadership role and you care to have a strong team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I really like that idea of looking at, you know, who do you trust and who trusts you the most? And, and look, that's, that's, a, that's a great piece of advice. Yeah, and finally, uh, you said the last part, tell the, the, the finding your voice, your assertiveness. So how do you – so – for some people, that's probably the easy part. Uh, uh, <laughs> right. uh, but for others, um, being assertive and finding your voice, that's terrifying, right? So how do you help people overcome that who aren't maybe naturally assertive people right. or, or used to putting themselves out there? Yeah, so, so let me start with the people who that already is a strength <laughs> for, right? Uh, for, you, you always find courage in the place of your discomfort. So mm-hmm. if you're like, oh, I'm, I'm Mr. Honesty, I'm brutally <laughs> honest, I'm honest with everybody. So for you, the act of courage that would be uncomfortable is to bite your tongue, yeah, right? Yeah. It's to let other people <laughs> have the floor because uh, you usually find it in discomfort. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people who require uh, more sort of assertiveness that, you know, one thing that I try to illustrate is that it's an act of self-goodness and self-respect because what you're doing is ultimately jipping other people of your ideas, yeah. of your innovations because of your fear. Your fear is getting in the way and it's holding you back, but it's holding others back from the benefits that they could receive if you had more courage to, co- you know, cough up your voice. Um, I ask people to get permission from their boss that they, their boss doesn't want them to be a brown noser. So, I mean, if you ask your boss, your leader, and say, look, I want to be there, do a good job for you on your goals that you've got that we need to accomplish this year. But, boss, I just want to make sure you don't need me to be a brown noser, right? right? And that boss is going to say, no, I don't want you to be. I want you. And then you have to say, great. Give me some coaching. How can I disagree with you in a way that your ears will hear it with reception so that you won't see it as disrespect on my part when I need to disagree with you? And then – at that moment in time, six months, a year later, when it happens, when you need to disagree with your boss, simply say, hey, boss, remember when we agreed that you don't want me to be a brown noser <laughs> and then you gave me coaching on what to say next? I have to say something to you next, boss, because now you've created a ground rule with your yeah. boss about how you can deliver that upward feedback message. Yeah, and uh, and obviously you've uh, you have the basis for trust there too, right? Because you, absolutely, you you started that up front. It's not like the what happens. I think in a lot of cases is, you know, maybe you hire somebody new, and first six months, you know, they're all like deferential, and then after six months, when they feel comfortable, suddenly they're coming back, and you're like, whoa, who's this person? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I love I love that idea of setting of setting ground rules. Well, listen, we're bumping up against the end of our time here. So before we finish up, I wanted to give you an opportunity to tell people a little bit more about yourself, your organization, how they can learn more about you and contact you. Yeah, terrific. And John, I really enjoyed talking to you. Yeah, Sales yeah, no, pop, I, how cool is that? I hope you'll, uh, I hope you'll actually come back because I'd like to go deeper into some of these. Oh, I'd love to. So the ways folks can get in touch with me, BillTreasurer.com. That talks about my keynote speaking and such. Uh, GiantLeapConsulting.com is my company. Courage Building is our program around building courage in the workplace and such. And, uh, you know, just Google me and you'll find all sorts of articles and that kind of good stuff. 
Yeah. And your, and the latest book, as you were saying, The Leadership Killer, Reclaiming Humility in an Age of Arrogance, is you and also uh, a, a retired Navy SEAL, right? Who wrote exactly. That book? Captain John Coach Havlick, retired Navy SEAL, served on all six, uh, all SEAL teams, including the very famed DevGrew. And if you look up DevGrew, you'll find out what SEAL team that is. <laughs> uh, John's a great guy. And you can find more about our book, Leadership Killer, at leadershipkiller.com. Perfect. All right, listen, Bill, this has been great. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. I'll see you all again for another inside interview really soon. Thank you.